In today's lecture, we're going to discuss the basic chemical nature of proteins. Proteins are regarded as being the most structurally complex and therefore functionally diverse of all organic macromolecules. Some of the structural roles that proteins play within the cell are those of the cytoskeletal components, such as microtubules, microfilaments, and intermediate filaments. Some of the metabolic roles that proteins play within the cell involve cell transport, immunity, gene regulation, and as enzyme catalysts. Protein molecules are composed of subunits or monomers known as amino acids. An amino acid consists of a central or alpha carbon associated with two functional groups, an amino group and a carboxyl group. Although all 20 naturally occurring amino acids are identical in this regard, they are distinguished from one another by their R or variable groups. As we will see, these chemical groups determine the unique chemistry of an amino acid molecule. Let's take phenylalanine, for example. The R group of this particular amino acid consists of a hydrocarbon ring, making this amino acid largely nonpolar and hydrophobic. On the other hand, aspartic acid bears a carboxyl group in its R group. As a result, the amino acid is considered to be polar and more hydrophilic. The following diagram illustrates the manner in which amino acid molecules interact with one another in order to form polypeptides, which themselves may give rise to functional proteins. During the polymerization reaction upon which amino acids are joined to form polypeptides, the carboxyl group of one amino acid molecule will interact with the amino group of another amino acid molecule by way of a dehydration reaction. The result of this interaction is the formation of a covalent peptide bond. In this particular example, the resulting molecule consisting of two amino acid residues is known as a dipeptide. All peptide molecules contain an amino acid, or N-terminus, and a carboxyl group, or C-terminus, at either end of the molecule. As a result of this polarity, peptide molecules can be indefinitely elongated due to the addition of new amino acids. Once established, a polypeptide chain can begin to form spontaneously according to its unique amino acid sequence. This reaction is thermodynamically favorable as evidenced by its overall negative delta G. Once properly folded, a polypeptide is now considered a fully functional and metabolically active protein which is able to participate in specific metabolic functions. As we might infer from this diagram, the specific folding of a polypeptide chain to give rise to a fully functional protein molecule establishes an overall three-dimensional shape, which in turn gives rise to unique binding sites or regions along the protein molecule that enables it to recognize, bind to, and interact with other molecules in a metabolically significant way. In studying proteins, we begin to realize that their structures are composed of levels of ever-increasing complexity, which ultimately dictates the protein's final structure and therefore its function within the cell. The levels of protein structure that we will consider here, from simplest to most complex, include primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. The primary structure of a protein represents the specific amino acid sequence of its polypeptide chain. As we can see, the amino acids that comprise a polypeptide chain are joined together exclusively by peptide bonds. As this diagram illustrates, the specific amino acid sequence of a polypeptide chain contributing to primary structure is genetically determined. The unique sequence of nucleotide bases within genes of the DNA molecule determine the exact type and sequence of amino acids 
that make up a polypeptide chain's primary structure. During a process known as transcription, this information is encrypted into a molecule of messenger RNA, which subsequently leaves the nucleus and interacts with a ribosome. During the process of translation, the genetic code encrypted within the messenger RNA molecule is effectively read, whereupon specific amino acids are assembled by establishing peptide bonds in a specific sequence to establish the primary structure of a polypeptide. As we will later see, the specific amino acid sequence of a polypeptide's primary structure will ultimately determine the manner in which this chain folds in order to produce a fully functional protein molecule. Once a polypeptide's primary structure is established, it may begin to either coil or fold in order to give rise to a secondary structure. The two main types of secondary structure that we will investigate involves the alpha helix and the beta pleated sheet. The secondary structure known as the alpha helix involves a coiling of the polypeptide chain due to the establishment of hydrogen bonds between non-adjacent carboxyl and amino groups throughout the polypeptide chain. The alpha helix exhibits an elastic property, whereas hydrogen bonds between these groups can break whenever tension is applied and reform when that tensional force is relieved. Alpha helices are found in proteins that constitute wool, hair, skin, and even nails. The secondary structure known as the beta pleated sheet occurs when sections of a polypeptide chain fold back on themselves, which allow adjacent carboxyl and amino groups to hydrogen bond with one another. Unlike the alpha helix, the beta pleated sheet can resist tensional forces and thus is not as elastic, but it does provide flexibility to protein structure. It is not uncommon for a protein to exhibit both alpha helices and beta pleated sheets in its structure. Tertiary protein structure is established through the formation of various types of bonds between the R or variable groups of amino acids in a polypeptide chain. This has the overall effect of folding the chain in order to achieve a three-dimensional structure which is capable of performing some meaningful metabolic activity. In regions of the polypeptide chain where R groups are hydrophobic, the chain will fold in such a manner as to shield these hydrophobic groups from the surrounding aqueous environment. This will have the added effect of bringing close together various other R groups such that they may establish hydrogen bonds or various types of covalent and ionic interactions, thus further folding the chain and contributing to an overall three-dimensional shape. Areas in which R groups are brought together such that a hydrogen atom of one R group lies close to an electronegative atom, such as an oxygen, of another R group will contribute to the establishment of weak hydrogen bonds. Moreover, in regions of the polypeptide chain in which nearby R groups bear a sulfhydryl group, they may interact in order to form covalent attractions known as disulfide bridges. Finally, in some regions of the polypeptide chain in which nearby R groups bear areas of opposite charge, there will be an electrical attraction such that an ionic bond will form between them. Some of these ionic bonds are sometimes referred to as salt bridges because they arise due to the electrical attraction between ionized basic regions and acidic regions of nearby R groups. As previously mentioned, once tertiary structure is achieved, the molecule itself assumes an overall three-dimensional structure which enables it to perform 
some vital metabolic activity. Some proteins, especially enzymes, become fully functional at this level of organization. Some proteins, such as hemoglobin, the iron-containing oxygen-binding protein found in red blood cells, achieve an even higher level of organization known as quaternary structure. This level of protein organization involves the association of two or more polypeptide chains that have achieved tertiary structure associating with one another in order to form a metabolically active complex. As we can see, the hemoglobin protein is composed of one, two, three, four polypeptide chains of tertiary structure held together by much of the same interactions that establishes tertiary structure, such as hydrogen bonding, covalent, and ionic interactions. In closing, we should be able to observe all the levels of protein organization when examining a protein structure. To reiterate, the specific sequence of amino acids within the protein represents its primary structure. We can also observe regions of coiling or folding, which represent the protein's secondary structure. The overall three-dimensional shape of the molecule as a result of the interactions between nearby R groups represents its tertiary structure. And if the protein is composed of two or more polypeptide chains of tertiary structure associating to form a metabolically active complex, then it exhibits the highest level of protein structure, that of quaternary structure.